This, this is Saurabh, and, and you're listening to my favorite talk show, The BG Show with Aditya. This is Saurabh, and you're listening to my favorite talk show, The BG Show with Aditya. Human beings by nature and nurture are biased, gullible, prejudiced, and hypocrites as it is visible during the current hallucinatory times as far as conversations around this pseudo virus is concerned. And then add to it terms like success and failure. Humans just love using these terms without even understanding that whether these terms even mean anything. It's a universal truth that when it comes to sports, academics, as well as economy, success and failure are terms used so much that after a while it becomes boring. Take the example of academics. A student gets 99% in exams and all the success is deemed to the passive stakeholders like schools, education, departments, parents, and of course, the biggest burden on an education system, the coaching centers. And another fact is that as human beings, we will embellish the marks scored by a student. That is, if the student scores 99% marks versus if a student scores 75% marks, the student scoring 99% marks will be given so much of importance, media coverage and all the praise in the world compared to another student who gets 75% and that is seen as efforts not done. Still more needs to be done. And then the situation worsens when universities start exploiting this marks, this high marks scored by students in their exams when they use and exploit the most archaic system ever in the Indian education system that is the cutoffs when the cutoffs start increasing which basically eliminates the individuals who got 75 percent so if you want to get in uh, elite university in India, especially in the capital, you need to score at least 99% aggregate as well as individual subjects. Now let's look at this line and further discuss it. As individuals, we all know that failure is inevitable. We know that the path to success is paved in failure. But discussion around failure will always be biased because according to me there is no success and there is no failure in absolute terms nobody succeeds and nobody fails but we spend so much time discussing words such as failure success and more attention is paid to another subjective and biased word like failure let's understand what defines Failure. We talked in academics that unless a student gets 99% in their school leaving exams, they are not deemed as intelligent students. For millennia, this logic has been applied to the profession of sports. So whether it's an individual or a team game, in world tournaments, we judge athletes by the number of medals they win. And not just any medal, but gold medal. So how is a country's sports infrastructure judged by the number of gold medal an athlete wins or a team wins? So for example, if the Indian hockey team in the next Olympics or the next World Cup are not able to reach the finals of that tournament, then by nurture and nature, we deem the team as a failure and we compare the team to the former teams of the 80s and the 90s because athletes of that time went on to win gold medals. And then when it comes to the ideology of success and failure, how can 
a country's economic progress be left behind. We look at economy in quarter. So if the economy is in negative, then the entire country is failing. And most importantly, the federal governments, that is the main governments at the center are failing. That there is a tendency to look at a country's economic progress and success in terms of employment and unemployment rate. So if the employment rate rises, then the country is on a path towards success. But on the other hand, if the unemployment rate rises, we put our heads down in shame as if the increasing employment rate is compared to an asteroid hurtling towards the earth and putting a dent in the progress. So eventually success and failure are judged by the numbers, whether it's sports, academics or economy. But in my view, there are no terms like success and failure. We spent so much time debating the ideology of success and failure because what defines success and failure is subjective. So if individual X gets 40,000 views for a video they posted on a video channel and individual Y gets 500 views, who will by design and default nature and nurture be deemed as a success? Of course, going by the numbers, the individual X who got 40,000 views and individual Y who got 500 views. It's not a bad number if you look at it entirely. But the one who got 500 will never be given the respect as compared to the one who got 40,000 views. And even though these numbers are not absolute, we look at them in such absolute ways. Coming back to academics, a university's success is deemed by the number of students who are employed when they leave college. So if 10 students get a package of X amount, then the university is seen as a successful university because eventually students are employed and that is the basic purpose of education. Before the idea of success and failure is completely abolished, the first step that needs to be taken is to remove this ideology of the marks system means whether you get 99% or 75%, the students deserve to go in a university of their choice and that means the step is to remove this archaic cutoff system and excuses of limited number of seats cannot be acceptable anymore which also means that terms like best seller needs to go away in terms of an author selling their books because if author x sells 1 million copies and author y sells 10,000 copies by design and default the 1 million copies sold will be the successful author and a successful book. The ideology of which itself is prejudiced, biased and, and reflects the gullibility of the human psyche. Which means we should stop clinging onto terms like learning from mistakes, stepping out of the comfort zone, being vulnerable as well as managing challenging feelings. Such terms should just be abolished from our thought process. While the definition of success and failure will always be subjective, that is, it will always be biased towards certain individuals or certain groups, one as an individual should stop feeling guilt, remorse and regret about anything. Labors of Hercules forward. Of course, you can never really get the spirit of the original. For the moment in his enthusiasm, he had forgotten Poirot. And Poirot, watching him, felt suddenly a doubt, an uncomfortable twinge. Was there here something that he had missed, 
some richness of the spirit, sadness crept over him. Yes, he should have become acquainted with the classics long ago. Now, alas, it was too late. Dr. Burton interrupted his melancholy. Do you mean that you are really thinking of retiring? Yes, the other chuckled. You won't, but I assure you, you won't be able to do it, man. You are too interested in your work. No, indeed, I make all the arrangements. A few more cases, specially selected ones. Not you understand everything that presents itself, just problems that have a personal appeal. Dr. Burton grinned. That's the way of it. Just a case or two. Just one case more and so on. The prima donna's farewell performance won't be in it with yours. Poirot, he chuckled and rose slowly to his feet, an amiable white-haired gnome. Yours aren't the labors of Hercules, he said. Yours are labors of love. You'll see if I'm not right. Bet you that in 12 months time you'll be still here and vegetable marrows will still be, he shuddered, merely marrows. Taking leave of his host, Dr. Burton left the severe rectangular room. He passes out of these pages not to return to them. We are concerned only with what he left behind him, which was an idea. For after his departure, Hercule Poirot sat down again, slowly like a man in a dream and murmured, The labors of Hercules, may we say un edi sa. The following day saw Hercule Poirot pursuing a large calf-bound volume and other slimmer works with occasional hurried glances at various typewritten slips of paper. His secretary, Miss Lemon, had been detailed to collect information on the subject of Hercules and to place same before him. Without interest, hers not the time to wonder why, but with Perfect efficiency, Miss Lemon had fulfilled her task. Hercule Pirot was plunged head first into a bewildering sea of classical lore with particular reference to Hercules, a celebrated hero who after death was ranked among gods and received divine honors. So far, so good. But thereafter, it was far from plain sailing. For two hours, Pirot read diligently, making notes, frowning, consulting his slips of paper and his other books of reference. Finally, he sank back in his chair and shook his head. His mood of the previous evening was dispelled. What people! Take this Hercules, this hero. Hero indeed, what was he but a large muscular creature of low intelligence and criminal tendencies? Poirot was reminded of one Adolphe Durand, a butcher who had been tried at Lyon in 1895. A creature of ox-like strength who had killed several children. The defense had been epilepsy, from which he undoubtedly suffered, though whether grand mal or petit mal had been an argument of several days' discussion. This ancient Hercules suffered from grand mal. No, Pirot shook his head. If that was the Greeks' idea of a hero, then measured by a modern standard, it certainly would not do. The whole classical pattern shocked him. These gods and goddesses, they seem to have as many different aliases as a modern criminal. Indeed, they seem to be definitely criminal types. Drink, debauchery, incest, rape, loot, homicide and secondary. Enough to keep a jus d'instruction 
constantly busy. No decent family life, no order, no method, even in their crimes, no order or method. Hercules indeed, said Hercule Poirot, rising to his feet, disillusioned. He looked round him with approval, a square room with good square modern furniture, even a piece of good modern sculpture representing one cube placed on another cube and above it a geometrical arrangement of copper wire and in the midst of this shining and orderly room himself he looked at himself in the glass here then was a modern hercules very distinct from that unpleasant sketch of a naked figure with bulging muscles brandishing a club Instead, a small, compact figure attired in correct urban wear with a moustache. Such a moustache as Hercules never dreamed of cultivating. A moustache magnificent yet sophisticated. Iliad Homer Book 1 She paused. But Zeus, who commands the storm clouds, answered nothing. The father sat there, silent. It seemed an eternity. But Thetis, clasping his knees, held on, clinging, pressing her question once again. Grant my prayer once and for all, father. Bow your head in assent or deny me outright. What have you to fear? so I may know too well just how cruelly I am the most dishonored goddess of them all. Filled with anger, Zeus, who marshaled the storm clouds, answered her at last, Disaster, you will drive me into war with Hera. She will provoke me. She will shrill abuse. Even now in the face of all the immortal gods, she harries me perpetually. Hera charges me that I always go to battle for the Trojans. Away with you now. Hera might catch us here. I will see to this. I will bring it all to pass. Look, I will bow my head if that will satisfy you. That I remind you that among the immortal gods is the strongest, truest sign that I can give. No word or Work of mine, nothing can be revoked. There is no treachery, nothing left unfinished. Once I bow my head to say it shall be done. So he decreed, and Zeus, the son of Cronus, bowed his craggy dark brows, and the deathless logs came pouring down from the thunderhead of the great immortal king and giant shock waves spread through all Olympus. So the two of them made their pact and parted. Deep in the sea, she dove from radiant Mount Olympus. Zeus went back to his own halls, and all the gods in full assembly rose from their seats at once to meet the father striding toward them now. None dared remain at rest as Zeus advanced. They all sprang up to greet him face to face as he took his place before them on his throne. But Hera knew it all. She had seen how Thetis, the old man of the sea's daughter, Thetis, quick on her glistening feet, was hatching plans with Zeus. So, who of the gods this time my Treacherous one was hatching plans with you. Always your pleasure whenever my back is turned to settle things in your grand clandestine way. You never deign, do you freely and frankly, to share your plots with me? Never, not a word? The father of men and gods replied sharply, Hera, Stop hoping to fathom all my thoughts. You will find them a trial, though you are my wife. Whatever is right for you, 
to hear no one trust me will no of it before you neither god nor man whatever i chose to plan apart from all the gods no more of your everlasting questions probe and pry no more pg woodhouse stiff upper lip jeeves he was a bit low when i blew in but on receipt of my news about the what not blossomed like a flower it would have done you good to have heard what he had to say about pop basse and talking of pop basse how did the school treat go off i think the juvenile element enjoyed the festivities sir how about you sir you were all right they didn't put your head in a sack and prod you with sticks no sir my share in the afternoon's event was confined to assisting in the tea tent you speak lightly jeeves but i have known some dark work to take place in the school street area tents it is odd that you should say that sir for it was while partaking of tea that the lad threw a hard boiled egg at sir watkin and it hit him on the left cheekbone sir it was most unfortunate could not subscribe to this i don't know why you say unfortunate best thing that could have happened in my opinion the very first time i set eyes on pop basse in the picturesque environment of bosher street police court i remember saying to myself that there sat a man to whom it would do all the good in the world to have hard boiled eggs thrown at him part of my crowd on that occasion a lady accused of being drunk and disorderly and resisting the police Take on received offered sentence. Her boot at him, but with a poor aim, succeeding only in beating the magistrate's clerk. What's the boy's name? I could not say, sir. His actions were cloaked in anonymity. A pity. I would have liked to reward him by sending camels bearing apes, ivory, and peacocks to his address. Did you see anything of Gussie in the course of the afternoon? Yes, sir. Mr. Fink Nottle at Miss Bassey's insistence played a large part in the proceedings and was, I'm sorry to say, somewhere roughly handled by the younger revellers. Among other vicissitudes, he underwent a child entangled its all-day sucker in his hair. That must have annoyed him. He is fussy about his hair. Yes, sir. He was visibly incensed. He detached the sweet meat and threw it from him with a good deal of force. And by ill luck, it struck Miss Bing's dog on the nose. Affronted by what he presumably mistook for an unprovoked assault, the animal bit Mr. Fink Nottle in the leg. poor old gassi yes sir to each life some rain must fall precisely sir i will go and bring your whisky and soda he had scarcely gone when gassi blew in limping a little but otherwise showing no signs of what jeeves had called vicissitudes he had undergone he seemed indeed above rather than below his usual form and i remember the phrase the bulldog breed passed through my mind if gussy was a sample of young england's stamina and fortitude it seemed to me that the country's future was secure it is not every nation that can produce sons capable of winning as he was doing so shortly after being bitten by aberdeen terriers so oh, there you are bertie he said jeeves told me you were back i looked in to borrow some cigarettes for 
more awesome content. Tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with Aditya.